You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Connor Sullivan on the show. He has an amazing new book. It's called Sleeping Bear, and this is a thriller that you must have in your summer to be red pile. Uh, I, I tell you what, this uh, for a for a debut thriller... This is one of the best that I've read in a long, long time, and I'm super excited to talk about it today. Welcome to the show, Connor. Thanks for having me, Hank. I'm excited to have you, Connor. Um, Connor, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I would say that, well, I always wanted to be a professional skier growing up, Um, and when that didn't work out, I kind of just got honest with myself and, you know, that's, it was probably around like 19, 20, 21 years old that I really decided that I wanted to be a writer, um, writer, storyteller in some way or form. I was always keeping journals when I was skiing. So I think, you know, by keeping those journals, I always I found myself writing fiction in them sometimes. And I think that's kind of the beginning of it, but Growing up, I was a really avid reader. Um, I read everything. So it was kind of the natural way to go, I guess. What was the first series or, or book that uh, that just really opened y- you up to the possibility, you know, that stories could take you anywhere? Uh, it was Harry Potter, for sure. Um, I remember being five years old and my dad got a advanced reader copy. I think it must have been of the Sorcerer's Stone, the first one. And I remember him reading it to me at night, and that was the first time that, you know, he would read a chapter and then I'd go to bed, but I'd actually grab the book and continue reading. I think that was the first book that I would actually do that with. And then from there, it just became an obsession. I was, you know, trying to get my hands on everything. So since you mentioned your dad, let's just go ahead and put it out there that that Mark Sullivan is your dad. Uh, And Mark's been on the show a couple of times. As a matter of fact, the, the latest time, just a month or two ago. Um, I think, but um, growing up in the presence of someone like your dad and just, you know, watching the the day-to-day activities of someone who is a professional writer and who has had, uh, you know, his his share of ups and downs in, uh, along his writer journey, which he shared on the show before. Um, but, uh, you know, the last few years especially – have been more ups than downs. Let's let's just be honest about it. What's it like, you know, growing up in the shadow of someone who's who's living the dream, if you know, so to speak. Yeah, I think it, it took me so long to actually say that I wanted to be a writer because of that intimidation factor. Um, but you know, once I decided that's what I wanted to do, you know, he he just you know completely supported me, of course. Um, but yeah, it was kind of daunting in a way, you know, because you grow up and when your dad, you see your dad every day working so hard and you see that those ups and those downs and, you know, the downs are really down and the ups are really up. Um, but you know, through it all, he's just, he's so hardworking and he's, it's inspiring to see him, you know, get where he is today. You know, it's just it's incredible. He just persevered and, you know, it's, it's, it's very inspiring. So I hope to, you know, follow in those tracks. For sure. Um, you know, other than, than the, you know, following the trajectory of, of his career, um, did he ever share any advice, you know, about writing about the craft, you know, of, of honing, uh, your skill to be the best writer that you could be? I mean, yeah, sure. It's it's funny when I first started out, like when I when I got out of school, I, you know, got my um, office set up. I got my desk and my computer. I was ready to do this. I just spent four years, you know, at a top writing school. And I remember looking at that page and not know the blank page for the first time. 
and not knowing what to do. I went, oh my God, I don't know how to write. <laughs> and I remember calling him immediately within like 20 minutes of staring at that page. And I said, dad, I don't know how to write. And he goes, figure it out. <laughs> and he hangs up. <laughs> but, that's, but that was, that kind of tough love is what, you know, that's the only way to do it. And he's, he said that to me, he's like, look, I can't really teach you how to write. Like you got to figure that out on your own. You need to find your voice. You need to, um, you know, learn sentence structure, learn paragraph structure. Then you go into chapter structure. And like, it, that was the best thing you could have ever done for me at the time. It was horrible, you know, but I then spent <laughs> years and years, you know, working at the craft. And of course, you know, I'll come to him with a pretty fit, like, finished manuscript and he'll he can go through it and go you know this is you need to tighten this up you need to you know add more tension here things like that but you know a lot of people always ask me like does he help and the answer is no really you know I mean yeah. he kind of just made me do it on my own and that because you can't have someone writing your books for you like at the end of the day right. it's you and you and, and that's how you learn so when there's a lot of advice that you can give someone about the, like you said you know sentence structure paragraph structure that sort of thing. But if you can't tell a story, nobody, nobody else can do that for you. Totally. Yeah. So from Harry Potter to, to sleeping bear, um, you know, which is, uh, a, a political thriller or a geopolitical thriller, however you, you want to look at that. Um, how do you, uh, what was it that got you interested in the thriller genre? Yeah. So again, you know, Harry Potter in my early teens like you know it was that's all I read and then I would say in my late teens I'd be on these big ski trips I'd be on tour all year I discovered Vince Flynn and the Mitch Rapp series and I read I read that and I just completely fell in love and then I started reading more like spy espionage thrillers like you know Robert Ludlum and um, Jean Le Carre and uh, just everything I could get my hands on and I was, and I kind of, it was almost like I found my, uh, I, I found my genre, but then I remember going to college and I kind of stopped reading that. I, I had to read more literary stuff. And, and then I had, you know, in the film school I was in, you know, we were always watching movies and studying that. And it wasn't until about a year after college. So I spent a year writing aimlessly you know, it was after my dad told me to figure it out and I didn't really know what genre I wanted to go in. And I kind of had that crisis of like, oh man, like, I don't know what kind of writer I am. And then I was like, wait a minute, go back to those books that you really like. So I went back and I studied Vince Flynn, Brad Thor, um, Mark Greeny, Jack Carr. And that was kind of like, okay, this is the, this is where I want to go and put my own twist on it. So I kind of just saw what I felt was missing in the genre and you know try to provide or bring my own voice to the table that that is such a simple piece of advice that i i think is a very difficult one for a lot of people to grasp um you know when you're when you're trying to figure out what to write go back to what you love to read um and and a lot of times i'm not saying that that's you know every good writer has written in you know kind of their guilty pleasure to read genre um but it's a good place to start for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it took, but again, you know, it took me a while to figure that out. Um, I'm glad I did, <laughs> but yeah. And that, I think that's great advice for people. Like, you know, be honest with what you want to write, why you want to write it. And then could you see yourself, you know, if it works out for you, could you see yourself writing that for the rest of your career or for a big chunk of your career? Yeah. Um, there have been some people that have been very uh, successful in the genre of Vince Flynn, Brad Thor d that you mentioned. Um, but you said you looked for what you thought was missing in the genre. And what did you decide um, that you could bring to the genre that uh, that would be a benefit and would would uh, would add to it? Yeah, so I. What I found in the genre there, it's, you know, it can be very military heavy, espionage heavy, but. A lot of the stuff took place in cities and especially like I, I loved Cold War genre fiction, like everything was happening in Moscow and Berlin. And um, I wanted to kind of touch back on my roots of where I grew up. I, you know, I, I live in Bozeman, Montana. I've lived here pretty much my whole life. And 
I wanted to somehow bring to the table the the more rural landscape to the spy novel. I mean, Sleeping Bear is very different. Like in terms of the spy novel, it's a woman goes missing in the woods book turns into a political thriller. Um, but if you look at the my main character, Cassie Gale and her father, Jim Gale, um, he has a very shadowy past and he's living in, you know, he's living in very, very rural Montana. And that's what I wanted to kind of bring to the genre is how can a spy be living in the middle of nowhere or a former spy or someone with these skills be living in the middle of nowhere. And I wanted to show that culture. And I based those characters off people that I know who live here, who had that career. Um, and I just found that fascinating and I wanted to bring that to the table. So for someone um, that's from Montana and, and you write a book that's, uh, you know, based uh, around there, uh, how do you feel like that the the place that you're from um, affects how you tell a story or the kinds of stories that you tell? Other than the obvious, you know, Sleeping Bears is is based in the in the in the West. Um, what do you, what is it about Montana um, that adds to you as a storyteller? You know, Montana itself is its own character. Um, I see it portrayed a lot, especially now it's being portrayed a lot in, you know, popular TV shows and stuff. And, you know, it, it's weird watching those shows about your hometown and you're just like shaking your head. You're like, this isn't even close. You know, this is. <laughs> and I and I like to kind of, you know, show little glimpses of what it's really like. Right. And how we kind of poke fun at things that are, you know, changing Montana or how it's portrayed in the media. Um, but for me, you know, I, I love, I love Montana. I mean, it's, it's my home. And again, it is a character. And I, I, in the books that I'm hopefully going to continue writing, it will always be a character in some way or form. Looking for a tool to help you visualize your story before the drafting begins. Plot pins is cloud-based and optimized for any device. But there's nothing to download. From the new writer who isn't sure how to tell their story to the veteran who can increase their productivity dramatically, we've had experienced writers lay out a detailed structure for several novels in a series in a matter of a few days. The app takes you through four steps of the process, the concept or logline. Make sure you have a solid concept that you can keep coming back to throughout the process. The outline, 12 beats and three acts, each has a description of what should be happening with examples. The board, 40 cards. We take the 12 beats and add sub beats to those, breaking it down even further and being very specific about what should go into each. These also have examples and descriptions. Right. We take those 40 cards and turn them into a to-do list. For a 50,000 word book, it's about two cards per chapter roughly. We have a beautiful editor built into the app. You can export your manuscript to a PDF anytime with the click of a button. Let Plot Pins help you visualize your writing project. Use code HANK10 to get 10% off Plot Pins. PlotPins.com. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website. Developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates, PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20, or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, 
at a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting, and we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. Someone might think Montana is uh, is an interesting um, place to set a political thriller. What what is it about Montana that kind of sets up the story? I I use it as a I don't know where I heard this, but you hear it a lot around here. Tough places produce tough people, and that's what I wanted to kind of work with that theme of Cassie and Jim Gale live in a very tough environment and. Because of that, they've had to adapt to that environment and be tough themselves. So I wanted to really bring that into the into the genre. Gotcha. Um, so so tell me about Cassie. Um, what went into kind of the making of this character? So Cassie Gale is she's a just kind of a collection of a lot of people that I know in Montana. You know, there are a lot of tough women that I know. Um, she isn't one particular one. She's kind of all of them just put together. Um, and when I was exploring that idea of trauma, you know, she's escaping a trauma that happened to her. So she's going to Alaska to kind of find herself again and start anew. Um, I wanted to put a very tough person who's gone through really tough things, you know, and then put them against another challenge and see how they overcome it. And, you know, with Cassie Gale, like she's incredibly capable, um, just considering her old profession and, you know, who she is. And and that's and that's kind of. Yeah, I don't know if that's a good answer. Or not, yeah. But. Yeah. When when you're writing Connor and, and you're you know thinking of a character like Cassie, uh, do you begin your writing process? You know, some people do full character sketches and they they fully build out a character um, before the they ever start writing the novel. They, you know, write biographies and, and they write, you know, about all of their family connections and try to uncover all of the little, you know, nooks and crannies uh, about a character that they can before they start writing. Other people have a character and, and like she just walks on the stage of their mind and 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 they almost write the book to discover the character um in in a way um what about you did how much did you know about cassie when when the novel began i would say i did a little of both of that um i knew about her pretty well um but again you know you don't really know your character until you put them in those challenging situations um and for me that had to just be the writing so i really you know i i wrote sleeping bear 20 times you know, <laughs> over five years. And that was when I really, you know, that's when you really discover your characters. Like, you know, in those final drafts, I was like, okay, there she is. That's, that's my full character right there. And especially with her dad. Um, so yeah, I, I, I did all that mapping out stuff, but that kind of changes when you're in, when you write as a story develops, you, you find your characters more. And that's what I did. So yeah, I did both. Gotcha. Um, Russia is an interesting um, uh, country to uh, to bring into a thriller because you know the the early days of uh, of Tom Clancy and uh, even Vince Flynn in the very beginning, Brad Thor in the very beginning. Um, Russia then was a very different place than it is now, um, and you know Tom Clancy, some of the the uh, the very best Tom Clancy stories are, you know, kind of the the U.S. versus the USSR, um, and you know, since all of that unraveled in the the late '80s, early '90s, um, you know, Russia has gone through several different um, sort of implementations, or, or it, and and now it's becoming um, this this uh this country that that is fun to write thrillers about uh, again um what did you do to start kind of learning about the the culture of russia and and how to uh, you know look for ways that you could build conflict 
Yeah, I mean, I do for, you know, I did so much research on Russia. I read so many books on Russia. I watched everything I could get my hands on. Um, I studied Putin. Um, and I, yeah, I, and I know like a lot of people do the whole USA versus Russia thing. And I just wanted to bring kind of a new twist to it just to see what like the SVR is doing. Um, that's their foreign intelligence and their FSB, which is, you know, also in, and the GRU. But I was just very like, and I think it came from when they were doing those blatant poisonings of their former spies. Um, that was when I really start. I was like, wow, it's amazing that they'll go through the lengths to do that. Even in today's time, you know, Putin will literally do, I mean, he's doing it right now. Um, and I really wanted to understand, you know, why is, why do they look so much like the old USSR? And it's essentially the cold war never ended. You know, Putin is just as thuggish as, you know, the KGB were, like in the 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s. So I just wanted to kind of see and, you know, how that would work in today's time. Yeah. How how much is accessible to a writer these days when you when you want to learn about Russia? Um, I would imagine uh, that there's a, a lot more information available now than than there was in the in the 80s when, you know, Clancy was writing or, or whomever. Um, it, is it uh, is there a lot of information out there and is is it difficult to start kind of putting the bigger picture together? Oh, there's so much information. It's insane, especially from, you know, dissident journalists, dissident Russian journalists. That's where you really get the um, the inside scoop of what's going on. And, you know, the Internet is providing just a massive swath of information. So, yeah, I mean, it's everywhere. That that was the that was what was hard is like at, at certain at a certain time, I, I was researching so much, I just had to stop because it was, you know, you can kind of go down that rabbit hole forever. But I kind of just had to find a little piece of what I wanted to talk about within this whole general scope of what Russia is doing, you know? Yeah. So Sleeping Bear, be it begins, it, it feels like it's one kind of story. And then, as you alluded to earlier, it morphs into this other kind of story um was that on on purpose uh did you set out to do that you know i, I i'm gonna uh I, i'm gonna get uh this character and get people to care about her and then you know spring this big story on them was that on purpose <laughs> <laughs> it's funny i so as i was writing it i you know it's like a it's a woman in the woods goes missing to a political thriller and i've never seen that before and it terrified me and i remember saying to my dad it just happened by the way too you know i i kind of started reading vince flynn a lot at that time and i was like okay let's just do something geopolitical here i've never and i would go up to my dad after years of writing this and i go i just wasted years of my life this this is never gonna sell this is <laughs> just not there's no way because, and and he goes why i'm like because it's so different and he goes, well, there you go. And I, I just said, no, you don't understand. It's horrible. Like, there's just, it's just not going to work. Like, and, and he just smiled and said, you'll see. And he was right, you know, and, <laughs> but we well, yeah, know that it there's, this, there's this big argument, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, between commercial writers, especially, and, and uh, some people, you know, say that like, it's a dirty word, like, like you want to spend years of your life writing something that that doesn't sell to anyone you know why would you do that um but you know the the whole um argument about writing to market versus uh writing what you're passionate about and then hoping there's a market there for that and um uh, you know writing something that is so different um it is that that has to be scary because it's never been done but then you have to think well if it's never been done then and someone's out there looking for something new and fresh. Oh, totally. And, you know, it, you're taking a risk, just being a writer in general, you're taking a risk, you know, you're creating something from your head, manifesting it onto a physical page and hoping that someone's going to like to read it. And I mean, yeah, Sleeping Bear was just terrifying for me because it was, you know, it's my first book. I've never written anything else really. And I just, I, I, I just said, I've never seen anything like this. I don't know how this is going to work. People are going to laugh at me, but you know, it worked out. So. 
Well, and and Sleeping Bear eventually found a home uh, at Atria, uh, Emily Bessler books, uh, who uh, Emily Bessler, you know, publishes all of the amazing books in in this genre. Uh, How did you how'd you wind up there? (laughs) Well, it's crazy. So I remember for. Might have been while I was in college or before college. I can't remember. I remember always seeing that logo on the spine of Brad Thor novels and Ben Swin novels and seeing the like the red fox that says Emily Bessler Books, Atria. And I remember yeah. going, wow. And I remember researching her and seeing that she pretty much discovered Vince, discovered Brad, um, discovered Jack Carr and you know so many others. And I just went, wow, that is like one day I want to work with her. Like I want her to edit you know, my work one day. And then, you know, when it, when I got my agents and it, it came time, I did a lot of revisions with them. You know, she was in that first, uh, four to send out. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, well, <laughs> there's just absolutely no way that she will, you know, take this book. And I kind of, you know, forgot about it. And it was at that time, I think they, they sent it out. My agent sent the book out or the manuscript out two days before the national shutdown <laughs> and wow. i was going there it is i just spent five years of my life to just the whole publishing world and the world collapses and uh you know for a month like i didn't hear a word from anyone and then uh you know you get that call that changes your life and that's what happened it was just i i i pretty much just accepted defeat started writing the next one and then boom you know it's a dream come true when you started thinking about cassie gale uh and and congratulations by the way uh with with landing at the publisher that you absolutely wanted to be at that's that's an amazing um but when you started thinking about cassie gale did you start thinking of her in terms of of a of a series character um no i i wrote sleeping bear as a standalone i think like especially at the end i was like I am so sick of this book. I am not going to look at this again. And, you know, I told Emily, I'm like, this is a standalone. And I, you know, pitched her my next book and series and stuff. And she was fine with that. But now it's like looking back, I'm like, I'm, I'm totally fine with writing a sequel. It won't be, you know, probably for a little while. But um, in the beginning, no, I I looked at this as a total standalone. Gotcha. Um, So I know that you are working on a second book. Um, what 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 are you writing these days? Um, so I'm writing the first book to hopefully a very long lucrative, lucrative series. Um, it's kind of about um, these people and that I I know and grown up around who have con- come back from specific government jobs after twenty twenty five years of service, and you know they live near us and very close with them and um it's it's again trying to bring something to the genre that hasn't really been done more of an insider's real life account of what it could be like working at these various shadowy government jobs so that's that's what i'm working on what do you think it is that that fascinates us uh so much about learning or, or or you know digging into kind of the dark crevices of of government you know the thing that uh you know uh we feel patriotic for our country and and we we love being americans uh uh yet we we love to look at the dark corners of of that it, it seems like such a dichotomy yeah for sure. I, I think what fascinates me are the people that do it and why they do it. And because one thing about them, and I've learned being around them so much in the last couple of years, is they don't do it for any kind of um, attention. They do these, they do some of the most dangerous jobs you could ever imagine for years and years. For for what? You know, they don't do it for the money. They don't do it for recognition. They literally live in the shadows doing these things. And and it's just it's flabbergasting to me that they can, you know, dedicate themselves the years and years of this service to their country. And, you know, it's fascinating to talk with them and how they view the world. And because at the end of the day, they're just people. They're not they're not these superheroes. They're human beings with emotions and feelings. And and it's just 
yeah, I always just found it fascinating how they can dedicate their lives to something like that. Well, Sleeping Bear is available everywhere now. When you're hearing this, uh, you can grab a copy you, uh, in, in hardcover if you uh, if you want a, a copy for your shelf, which you absolutely should have. Or if you prefer reading on Kindle, it's available Kindle edition. Um, also, audiobook. Have, have you heard uh, any of the audiobook yet, uh, Connor? I haven't heard it. I know it's done. Um, Hillary Hubert does it. Um, is it Haber or Huber? I have to check. I haven't heard it yet, but I'm very excited. I love listening to audiobooks, and it's going to be, it's supposed to be great. So, what do you think about, uh, you know, having this novel that you spent so much time on, uh, and, and then having someone interpret it for audio? What, how, how does that make you feel? Oh, I'm, I, I love listening to audiobooks. I actually have an app on my, uh, I, I work, I write in Scrivener and I use the speech app all the time to hear it back and hear the cadence of the chapters and stories. So I'm completely fine with that. Um, I'm just such a big fan of audiobooks in general. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to put links to all the ways that you can grab it in the show notes of this episode. Sleeping Bear, a thriller out available everywhere when you're hearing this. Connor, this has been so much fun chatting. Uh, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they connect with you online? I am on Twitter at C. Sullivan Books. Um, I am on Instagram at Connor underscore Sullivan underscore author. And I have the Facebook, but I don't really use it at all. So mostly just Twitter. I'll probably be the most active. Gotcha. And you have a website as well, don't you? Yep, I do. <clears throat> Sorry, it is. I have to look at. I think it's ConnorSullivanAuthor.com. Gotcha. We'll link all that up in the show notes to make it easy for folks to find you. Connor, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. We're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of Sleeping Bear. Thank you so much, Hank. Wargate Books presents Hit and Fade Forgotten Ruin, Book Two by Jason Onspach and Nick Cole. Narrated for you by Christopher Ryan Grant. Chapter 1. The Army of the Dead walked straight into our ambush east of Fortress Hawthorne. That's what the fob is called now, Fortress Hawthorne. Despite it being officially known as Forward Operating Base Hawthorne, as was originally intended when the 50 detachments of various special operations groups came forward through time from Area 51. A one-way mission to save Western civilization from a rampaging nanoplague destroying the very fabric of said civilization. Apparently, we overshot the temporal insertion point and stuck the landing. Sorta. About 10,000 years too late. Said civilization is now basically something straight out of Tolkien, or Dungeons and Dragons, which we've all now gotten a lot more familiar with thanks to our resident expert and fledgling hedge wizard, the infamous P.F.C. Kennedy. But the Rangers just call it the FOB. The first of our explosives to ruin the leading elements of the Army of the Dead advancing on us Claymore mines the recaptured forge back at Hawthorne had cranked out in the weeks after we'd retaken it from King Triton, were fired by Ranger Sergeant Kang down there with the scouts and Captain Knifehand's assaulters. It was close to midnight when the front rank of bony warriors, carrying rotting shields and spears, eyes glowing malevolently in the deep night mist, advanced into our ambush only to get ruined by the daisy-chain Claymore's sudden eruption. Above us, a cloud-shrouded moon cast a wan yellow light over the battlefield. The night was hot, and spring was coming on full now. The pilots who'd gotten us here in the grounded C-17 back at Ranger Alamo, using their meteorology skills, had guessed it was going to be a long, hot summer ahead of us and an early one at that. But there was a cold shiver in the dark on your exposed skin that you couldn't quite explain when you saw the dead advancing rank after rank. The bone warriors carrying spear and shield, other darker creatures barely seen, 
The lower areas of the earth were graveyard cool and misty, so maybe that was it. Still, the brutal, unrelenting cold of our almost last stand back at Ranger Alamo was gone now. But not the horrors. There wasn't a night that some ranger didn't wake up out of a tormented sleep, breathing heavy, sidearms scanning the dark and looking for orcs and ogres to ventilate. I was sweating in the hour leading up to the attack, despite the night and the mist. Kurtz had us humping hard to get the 240 and all its ammo up to the top of a small hill that overlooked the area where we'd channel the advancing echelons of the Army of the Dead into further fun and games the rangers had planned at a bend in a riverbed. If the approaching Army of the Dead continued on their current course track, they'd enter it for a brief period. It was decided by the captain we'd kill them there. And I was sweating. Not because of fear. No, not at all. Firing, whispered Sergeant Kang over the comm as he detonated the mines. And eight daisy-chained claymores spat thousands of steel balls all across the front line of what even I was still finding it hard to believe I was seeing through my night vision device. Skeletons. Warrior skeletons. Ancient warriors like something out of the Bronze or Iron Ages. Worked breastplates of molded plate or rotting scales. Green and tarnished, stamped with the markings of fabled armies fallen in battles long, long ago. Leather cuirasses on some. Rotting boots. Helms with broken horns, missing teeth, tattered leather kilts. Beads and charms dangling from bone wrists. Enigmatic holy signs and primal torques black with grave dirt or from a funeral pyre long ago on some forgotten battlefield far from here, draped about the spine where the throat should be. Where it rises to connect to a bone-white skull that seems filled with malevolent purpose and diabolical intelligence. Malignantly so. Walking skeletons like something out of a Ray Harryhausen clay model Sinbad epic from the 1960s. Above, the sliver of moon gave enough light to strengthen our NVGs, making the night vision devices perform exceptionally well as we sprang our trap and watched the advancing elements get rocked by our initial high-explosive opening bid in the game we were about to play. The air was still and hot in the moments before the fight began as we lay there in the tall, sharp grass, waiting for it all to go down. I was thinking a hot cup of coffee would be nice about now, except my canteen only had cold coffee I'd brewed during the long, silent, and windy afternoon of preparation. Still, I was happy knowing I had some, rather than none. Authors, if you're looking for a partner to help ensure that your book is the best it can possibly be, look no farther than Pico's House. Crystal and her staff make a conscious effort to be critical yet courteous. They also strive to make the business side of things run smoothly so that you can rest easy knowing that your manuscript is in capable hands. Whether you need beta reading, developmental editing, a manuscript critique, line editing, copy editing, or proofreading, Pico's House is the one-stop shop for you. Check them out today at picoshouse.com to get started.